What's up guys, I thought it would be cool to sit down and make this video because I do see a lot of messages from people asking if music school is worth it, should I go to music school, should I even try, ANSWER! And my honest answer to that is whether music school is worth it or not is entirely up to you. I know that answer was very generic, but what I meant by that was some of the most valuable lessons that I learned in music school were learned on my own, usually the hard way and not by a professor. And because I was in music school during this time, going through all of these hard lessons, it was like I was sheltered in a way. Like there was more room to make mistakes. Music school was like the firing range in Apex Legends. You could practice your skill and try a bunch of new and risky things, but once you got into a real game of Battle Royale, 90% of what you learned in the firing range went out of the fucking window. But it's that 10% that you gained that eventually adds up over time, particularly over the course of four years. So because I don't think I'd be a proper YouTuber if I didn't make a video touching this subject, here are seven things I wish I learned in music school. Number one, this may be an obvious one, treat yourself like you are a business. When an artist hires you to play, make them sign contracts. I mean, don't make them, don't be like, you know, come up with some type of written agreement. When you hire an artist, do the same thing. I'll give you an example of why I learned this the hard way. This last tour I did on the East Coast with my band, Everything Yes, and I'm not gonna say names because I don't wanna throw anybody under the bus. But imagine you're about to go on your debut headline tour with your boys. Cities have been announced, tickets are being sold, hotel rooms have been booked, the van has been paid for, everybody's ready to go, everything paid for. And then boom, your piano player decides to bail after everything has been announced. But not just bail, bail through voicemail, bro. So now not only do you have to find a new keyboardist, but you also gotta figure out pay, how much he charges every show, and then teach him 90 minutes of hard ass, nerdy ass, jazz fusion music. And keep in mind, the tour starts in a couple of weeks, but this could have all been avoided if we presented him with some type of agreement, some type of contract, some type of, hey, you're gonna play here on these days, please. If you agree, sign the contract, and if I bail, I'm gonna get fucked. Now I got no hate towards my boy. In fact, I'm, I'm really grateful he decided to bail. If it weren't for that, we wouldn't have reconnected with our old friend from college, Reggie McNeil. And guys, Reggie is basically a robot. So he, he came in, learned the music quickly. Now even better, he's a permanent member of the band. I think, hopefully. You, you never know with keyboard players, let's be real here. Now, as for our old keyboardist, guys, I'm gonna be honest, I'm slightly petty, but we actually used part of that voicemail he sent to quit the band to open our show. <laughs> I've decided the best thing for me to do is to not do this tour. But still, it's, it's all love. Everything's forgiven, we're all good. Number two, networking. Guys, you've heard it before. You gotta network, but nobody actually tells you how to network. I've found that in this field, a large piece of the pie is whether or not you're a good hang. So if you're at a jam session and let's say there's a bass player there that's really killing, you aspire to play and collaborate with this bass player. Don't just be like, hi bass player, here's my business card. <laughs> Try to introduce yourself and be friendly. Be like, hey man, nice to meet you. My name is Jack Mehoff. Man, you really played your ass off on that tune, the chicken. <laughs> Bro. What are you wearing? You, sm you smell really good. <laughs> All right, maybe don't sniff them, but you get the point. You know, come, come with a friendly demeanor. At least from my experience in this field, you got to create relationships first and then business later. Even the friends you make in school could be the very friends that you share a stage with later on in your career. Hell, I just realized this today. The guys I perform with regularly now, the everything yes guys, we all met in jazz combo class. I just realized this the other day. Now I've heard of a saying where there are three considerations for every gig. Good people, good music, and good money. But you can only pick two of those things. But wait, you can have all three of those things if you create those relationships now while you're in music school and just keep on grinding and building, baby. Just keep on, keep on going. Number three, this shit is expensive. Now listen, if you're like me and you've never been really good with budgeting or money, then you need to get good at it fast. 
or at least hire someone. Musicians, myself included especially, often deal with a lot of expenses related to their craft, such as instrument maintenance, rehearsal space rentals, school, lessons and travel costs, recording gear. I find that simply writing down all of your expenses will help you keep track so you can prioritize where to allocate your funds next. If you need to spend money, then spend money on things that you think will advance your career. For example, I used to spend way too much money on symbols. Like I'm talking a shit ton of money. Like why did I need so many symbols? I already had an symbols and like a dummy I start you know filling them around in my wallet and I'm like man what where's all my money going but by writing down these expenses seeing that sometimes I would spend over a thousand dollars in one month on symbols by writing that down the next month I decided to use half of it to spend money on the microphone the Yamaha EAD 10 and another half on a camera, a cheap camera, AKA the birth of this YouTube channel that you're watching. So please try to spend your money on things that you genuinely believe will help advance your career. Which brings me on to my next point, number four, social media. Now who better to have on this subject than, than my little brother, the Mario Kart lick guy. Oh, come on. <laughs> now I don't mean to sound like a douchebag, but the only reason why I'm doing drum clinics around the world and we're selling out shows with everything yes, the only reason why that is, can you guess what it is, Nathan? Social media. <laughs> Guys, we're from a small town in North Carolina. Nobody cared about us until we put on a camera on our face and we started going like this. <laughs> yeah, for me, I didn't even know I was gonna develop an audience. I just like to make videos where I clap really fast when I was 10 years old and then play in two times speed and think I have like magical powers. Then I saw some 12 year old make $700 in a month. I was like, huh? So then I started grinding. I was like trying everything. I was making how to put on your contact lenses tutorials, how to make animation tutorials. And the first thing that went viral was a Mario Kart link. So I changed my channel name from Project Idiot to Saxologic and I made saxophone videos. And then the rest just sort of happened naturally. You hear that? The internet is powerful but use it as a tool. Don't make it your whole life. Now I see too many guys get that one viral TikTok video to really pop off and then they quit their day job and try to pursue social media full time. So then maybe numbers start to go down, views start to go down. Like our channel. And trust me, once you start to make your views, your numbers and your social media profiles be the very thing that defines you, it's not gonna end well. And that is a good reason why I try to keep social media at a distance and not make it my whole life, all right? Now on to number five, groupies. Now this, just like everything else in this video, is entirely my opinion. And I don't mean to make anyone uncomfortable, but my fellas, don't think just because you're playing nerdy jazz fusion music or classical music for that matter, or any type of music where you wouldn't expect groupies, don't think that there still won't be groupies trying to hit you up after the shows. Now I've personally known ho groups of people that will literally go to shows just to try and sleep with other members of the band. Why? I don't know, but thank you. Just kidding. My personal recommendation is to just not get involved romantically with those types of people. And trust me, you'll know once you see these types of people. And it might be tempting, but then you're gonna think back to this video and you're gonna see my face. And you're gonna be like, huh, you know what? No, I don't want gonorrhea. Pass. Number six, physical health. Something that I wish my professors talked about more in music school was how your health correlates to how you play. Just recently being on the road, I found that playing a full 90 minute set night after night on four hours of sleep is a huge difference from doing the same thing on eight hours of sleep. It literally made a huge difference on how I played, right? I'm talking like night and day, baby. So make sure you're having plenty of sleep. And I know that's kind of difficult to do in music school. You know, you got the 8 a.m. music theory classes and you're out playing until like three or 4 a.m. I know it's hard. Now it's no secret that I'm a gym bro, okay? People call me a douchebag. They call me a chad. They say that my shirts are too tight. Hey, whatever. But if I had to choose between lifting weights and doing cardio, I would just stick to cardio all day. Because what I've been doing recently is I've been incorporating a lot of cardio into my daily routines. I, you know, I'm still hitting the weights, don't get it twisted. But I've been doing a lot of cardio, particularly in the mornings, and what this has done to my energy levels has been crazy. I'm able to think clearer and I'm more mentally like laser focused on a given task. But more importantly, I'm able to play chops longer and faster without getting winded.
And you don't even need a gym membership for this type of thing, you know? Just take your dog an extra 15 minutes of walking every day. You know, get that heart healthy. And one more thing, I don't know who needs to hear this, but drinking will not make you play better. Number seven, teaching. Now, everybody goes into music school thinking, hey man, I'm gonna perform for a living, bro. Those who can't do, teach. Wrong. You'll always find yourself teaching, even if you don't mean to. It's just what we do as artists, you know? We pass down information. Hell, the other day, I was trying to teach a kid how to play a blues shuffle because we're in Memphis and we play a lot of that. And he couldn't quite get the feeling down because I told him, you know, it's kind of like jazz, but not really because of the heavy two and four on the snare drum and the back beat. And after confusing him and frankly myself, I finally go, you know what? Repeat after me. What the f Yo! And then he's like, what? I'm like, no, repeat after me. What the f Yo! I say, no one ever really says, what the fuck? Yo! Like, what the fuck? Wow. No, they go, what the fuck? You know, there's a bit of a swing to it. What the fuck? Bruh. And then I go, now you try it. He gets on the drum set, and guess what? He totally nails it. So not only did I accidentally simplify what I was trying to teach him to begin with, the concept came to him that much faster, and so did the feeling. To be able to simplify a difficult concept into easily understandable explanations is a skill unto itself. And just like all skills, the only way to get better at them is just to keep doing them. I remember seeing a Ron Carter masterclass, and someone asked Ron Carter, hey man, like when it comes to playing the bass with a drummer, do you tend to play behind the beat or ahead of the beat? And Ron Carter, he looked kind of confused, and he was like, uh, well, I, I kind of just, I, I watch the drummer's stick, and when that stick hits the ride cymbal, that's when I play bass. <laughs> and everyone's like, oh, whoa. Now I asked the same question on my Instagram. I asked you guys, hey, what are some things that you wish you learned in music school? And here are a few honorable mentions. Creativity without business is exploitation. Business without art is pointless. Other people don't care about that seven over four polyrhythm that you can play. Feel versus being on beat, that's a good one. Everything I played wasn't great like my professors told me it was. That was kind of depressing. Space between notes is just as important as what you're playing, or else it's just a mess. And my personal favorite, they ain't calling just because you have a degree. Guys, let me know in the comments what are some things you wish you learned in music school or things that you learned recently that you're really grateful for. And before I go, I just thought I should let you guys know that my ebook, 30 Dirty Grooves, is currently on sale right now, so you better take advantage of that. So yeah, check that out on groovelogic.club or click the link in my bio. All right, guys, that's it for me. Those are my seven things that I wish I learned in music school. Other than that, thank you guys for watching the video. I will see you on the next one, man. Let's go. Let's go.